it's um, verse 2 to Judges 6. It's certainly what is him to lead us. He does lead us, unconsciously lead us. You know, he's so tender, he's so um, approachable. I was thinking about how he's so approachable. God is so approachable. You know, you think of it, if you had to visit the president or, or the queen or somebody, you'd be kind of, oh, you know, because uh, you feel like they're not approachable because they're different kind of person, you know. And But the Lord, he makes himself lower, right? Like Zacchaeus. He wanted to win Zacchaeus. So he goes, I think Zacchaeus in the Jericho, was it? He's in the lowest city. And, that, and Jesus had to go to the lowest city and he had to look up. And, and, and he put himself in, beneath Zacchaeus in order to win Zacchaeus to himself. And, he, and that's what God, the mighty, that's what makes him so great. He's able to put himself lower than, humble himself lower than you so that he can reveal himself to you, right? And that's, so he's so approachable. You know, he's so, I don't want to say common, but just like a, a common person. You'd meet a humble, if you met Jesus, literally, the man that walked the shores of Galilee, he walked into this building right now, he'd just be the most humble, friendly person. And you'd just be so approachable to him. And, you know, and yet that would be God, the great creator himself, himself. And so that's, that's the God that we want to come into relationship with. So uh, Judges chapter 6, just, we're going to read 12 verses. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And God always, sometimes he has to put the whip on people, you know, when you... You uh, you lose sight of of the Lord and you do things and you get influence and sometimes God will have to lift his take his hand off and let the devil you know bring some correction. See, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east. Even they came up against them. And I want you to notice three powers gathering against the people of God at the time of seed sowing. Because we've had seed sowing in this, in this generation, right? Teaching. We've had Pentecostal teaching. We've had Baptist teaching. But we've also had the, teach, the opening of the word has been sown in this generation. So, so there is there is no harvest time unless there is first the seed is first sown, right? Now verse four, and they encamped against them, and des and destroy the increase of the earth till thou come into Gaza. And without we we notice that the first four seals, it, uh, the, sorry, the first four trumpets is dealing with the destruction of the earth, right? So because because this is the season we are in. With the, the global crisis where the earth is, it's, you know, it's um, a time when there's economic pressure. Destroy the increase of the earth till they came to Gaza and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. So, so no food on the grocery shelf, see? Economic pressure coming against the people of God because the population explosion, right? All these different things going on. So these are, we got to, like the love story, Brother Adam said, you have to read between the lines. And so we, we're not trying to make it say something, but we're just recognizing that, we can, that God has put in here that a mystery of this hour that we're living in. And so for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and, the, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels that were, the, were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Look at that, destroying the earth, that, that um, you know, industrial industry and, and, and science and civilization, all those things, and population invasion or an, an explosion, it was, it's affecting the land, right? 
And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it's a shame that God often has to use hardship to get his back sudden people to turn to him. He's just a shame that he has to do that. But we saw that throughout the book of Judges, you'll see this cycle of, you know, when things get easy, then the Israel backslid. Then God loosed, you know, a nation on them, and then they cried to the Lord, and then God sent a judge, and, and we know that the pattern, and it's showing us, you know, a pattern sometimes of our own lives also, right? So we learn from that. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. So God is showing us in type of the process of how that he first sends a prophet. Look at what he is going on here. A prophet is, comes on the scene and, and all this and this, the um, this situation and so we know that God has repeated this by sending a prophet in our day also because three powers have gathered against the bride and the sour also, right? But then we'll notice that after he sends a prophet that there follows another ministry of the Lord himself in order to take his people out of self-doubt because that was Gideon's problem, right? He, he, had, he was in this condition of self-doubt and so the prophet's ministry on its own didn't deal with that problem that Gideon was under that condition. Uh, so what follows that prophetic ministry is another ministry of the Lord himself in order to take his people out of self-doubt and into a confidence of who they really are in Christ. And so we, we know the pattern that is, is showing us here in the book in the book of Judges, verse nine. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord that sat and sat under an oak, which was an offering that pertained to Joash the Abizarite. And his son Gideon, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress. So that, so now this, so this was harvest time. Now we just read in the early part; it was seed time, and now it is the harvest time. So sowing seed time had long been over. So it's showing us, uh, of course, where we are in this hour. Because we know that all the seeds have, have, have been sown in this age by Malachi 4 and different, uh, different ministries. And so now it's, it's harvest time. And it says, that he, so he was threshing this wheat, wheat uh, to hide it from the Midianites. So it's showing that he's, he's in them fear, right? In economic pressure, they got the three powers gathered. Sowing's over, it's harvest time. In verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. And I certainly trust that the Lord has appeared to each one of us, right? We need him to appear to us. It's not just the, the God sent a prophet, it's wonderful. But we need him to appear to us after that prophetic ministry. We've received that prophetic ministry. We want the Lord to appear to us also. And listen to what he said to Gideon. And said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And that's the message that we he's spoken about us also in this hour. The Lord is with us, thou mighty bride of valor. All right. So let's bow our heads. And just ask the Lord's blessing upon the, the what has been read. Lord, we just thank you for gathering us once again. Pray that your blessing upon these little thoughts this morning. We're just going to get part way through this subject, Lord. But we just pray that your anointing would be upon us, Lord. Upon the speaker and upon the hearer, Lord. Because we would certainly gather in vain if it wasn't for your Holy Spirit. Upon the speaker and upon the hearer, Lord. 
So we ask in Jesus' name that you would come on the scene and reveal yourself to us, appear to us this morning. Lord, just just soften our hearts that we can receive the, the, the word of life into our souls this morning, Father. To make any problems in our thinking, Lord, just straighten us out by your Holy Spirit. By these words this morning, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I, I just wanted to uh, entitle this this uh, kind of subject, and, and I said to Jason, "Are we going to make this part one?" I said, "Probably not, because I might change change uh, the title." But this, as a title, coming out of self doubt and into the revelation of your real self. So that's kind of the subject, coming out of self doubt, because we saw that Gideon is certainly. Um, uh, was in self-doubt of himself right? right at this time of economic pressure, three powers and all these different things. And we've been through these subjects before a little bit. And so we, ha we, have, we know that, that the book of Judges is, speaks of this time that we're living in. And so I want to here, I just want to kind of give you a, a, like a destination of we are that we want to head to a destination of divine love, right? Because divine love is our destination. And, and when Brother Brennan went beyond the curtain of time, he said that he says you, this is divine. This is agape love, right? Agape is God's love, and filio has limitations, right? It's like a brotherly love. But if you upset me bad enough, the love's off. The love's gone, right? Then, of course, you get to a, the, the eros. I think there's four loves, isn't there, in the Greek? I think eros. And, of course, that's what, um, who was it? Um, Amnon, was it Amnon? Was it Tamer, was it? Was that the right? Remember that? Oh, he loved her so much. Oh, he thought he loved her so much. And then all of a sudden, boom, he hated her. So the love, that love didn't, wasn't very much of a love, was it? If you really loved that girl, you, would, you wouldn't treat her like that for a start. And, you know, so we, we see all these different levels of love. And unfortunately, in English, we just have love, you know. But, um, but there's lots of different types of love, right? You can say, well, you love your dog or you love your cat, right? But that's a different love to a child, mother's love to a child, right? And it's a different to God's love. So, we, you know, we love our car or something, you know. And, or, you know, people use that in such a, um, that word, an English word, but, but we want to head into, into the, a destination of divine love. And you'll see as maybe another two or three services. Because Genesis begins with divine love, with Adam giving his life for Eve, right? He knew I have to give my life. Because there wasn't another Eve and Adam. It's like, okay, God, burn her and I'll be alone again, right? Like... I'll save the whole creation and my own life and save the world of death for 6,000 years and wars and I'll save all that. I'll sacrifice her. You know, it's, it's a pretty good trade-off, right? You know, if you do the math, right? A whole world of 6,000 years of sorrow and pain and death, right? And then I'll just get another, another, another wife, you know, there's no problem. But there was no other wife. It's, there was only one, one Eve in Adam. Right? That was the mystery. There wasn't no more. That was a part of himself. You see, that, see the, the great mystery of it. And so divine love that could sacrifice not just his own life, but certainly the animal kingdom, his, his godship, his dominion over the earth, all that, he paid such a price to... To, uh, for his, because of his love for his wife. So we see that, that Genesis begins with divine love. And Genesis ends with divine love, with Joseph forgiving his brothers. And his brothers couldn't understand that level of love because when their father finally passed, you know, uh, Jacob uh, finally passed away, his brothers thought, he's going to get us now because he's only being nice to us because because dad was alive, you know, but now he's going to really get us because they couldn't understand 
hey, we really hurt this guy. We were, we just actually deserve, you know, to, like he could just kill us all with just one with, with a word. That's how powerful he, you know, he had become the, the head of the whole of Egypt, which was the whole of the world, really, uh, of that time, right? And they, they couldn't understand divine love. And so we want to understand divine love because, you know, I was thinking about, uh, you know, a little conversation I had with Brother Marcus and, like, he was preaching, you know, about some of the, how the churches don't get on, right? Like, but quite nasty. Like, there's some nasty stuff even. It's not even human friendly, right? You know, I, I said to him after the service, I said, brother, the, I said, the problem, that problem is, it's agape, it's filio love. It's not agape love, right? So they haven't arrived at their destination. The destination is agape love, is divine love. That's our destination. And so that it shows, you know, when, when churches, um, it's like woman in the harem, you know, they're all having fights, Right? And and it's like, well, it's not really what what the Lord wants, right? And so, well, the Lord doesn't like it when this message, he doesn't like it because that's a denominational spirit. They all fight and they all proselyte and they all, all right? And said, Brother Benham said, God doesn't, he doesn't like that, right? He doesn't like division and, and seeds. When people sow seeds of discord among brethren, God does not like that. And... And there's many ways to kill a person's influence. You know, you just you don't even have to say anything. Uh, you, well, you don't even have to do anything. You can just say a little, "Well, brother, so and so, yeah, I know some things about that brother," and you know, just pray for him. Just pray for him. You know, and and you can just sow things that you, your intent, right? And so God knows the intents of our heart. So this, so the, so Brother Branham said one thing. I heard him say it just the other day when I was, because I felt to go through. I'll tell you the messages I've been going through. When love projects, then divine grace. Right? There's three sermons that Brother Branham talks about when love projects. I think 1956, and he tells the testimony of the killer bull, and he tells the testimony of the man, the Oregon that was going to punch him right off the platform, and he tells the story about the the hornets and. He mentions those stories. He said, "He said, oh, I wish that could happen every time. So it wasn't something that that he could just that just happened because he was super spiritual, right? Oh, well, I'm just so spiritual. That's why I've got I've got divine love in me, right? right? Brother Branham admitted that he didn't have that because he said when that bull rose up in that paddock, he said he panicked. He didn't use that word panic, but he said he was frustrated." And he went for his gun. I'll shoot it and then I'll pay for it. I'll have to pay for it, you know, because it was a prized breeding bull, you know. It's the only reason, because you don't keep killer bulls is, unless they're really worth something for breeding, but it's just not dangerous bulls are bad, bad news, right? And, um, but he said, and but something came over him, right? Right? Something came over him. He said, oh, I wished. It would be like that every time. Right? The same thing happened, experience happened with the hornets. The same experience happened with the, the, the madman that was going to deal the blow to him. So when he gets beyond the curtain of time, he said, this is what you, but this is divine love. He said, nothing enters here without that. Right? So you can't, one thing for certain folks, you can't manufacture that. You can't like, you know, work yourself up into it. Right? It's to, it has to. It had, the love of God is shed in your hearts by you reading positive thinking books. No, by the by the Holy Ghost. But He's promised it, right? He's promised it. And, you know, I was saying to my wife this morning, I believe in the supernatural. We we have to be believers of the supernatural. That God is able, you know, to give us the Holy Ghost. He's able to give us divine love. He's able to do things for us. He's able to heal us when we're sick, right? He's, we, th these are supernatural things, right? 
And, and we believe is because God's a great creator. I, I said, we look at this big tree out the back of our place. I said, God, that's supernatural, that tree. God created that. Where did that come from? Everything's supernatural. All right? It's only that we've, we're, it's natural, to, it's become natural in our thinking because it's just, oh, well, this is just, you know, everything's normal. But it's not normal. See, nothing's normal. God's, God's a creator of everything, right? So he can heal you. He can fill you with the Holy Ghost. He can, he can give you divine love. So, so that's, that's the, and, and I was saying that to Brother Marcus because I said that it's a lack of agape love in the people, right? Because you just, I don't like the churches fighting, right? It's just not, it's just leave people alone, pray for people, and just let God deal with his own business when he comes to dealing with people's lives. It's not for us to try and put people in and put people out. That's God's business. He knows He knows the person's heart. You don't even know the person's heart. You hardly even know the person. You, you, somehow you can judge them and put them uh, in categories or whatever. We don't even know, right? Many people have you know, come and come and gone over the years and and even we don't know the heart. It's in the heart of people that, that God is it's where we want to know God in our heart, folks. Really know him because when we're breathing our last breath, God forbid, but we won't be like, Oh, I you know, we want to know the Lord ourselves, right? And he like I said in the pre service, he wants you to he wants you to find him. So praise the Lord. So so coming out of self-doubt and into the revelation of your real self is kind of the subject we want to look at and lead into this direction or a destination of divine love. So we see clearly a pattern in this story of, of Gideon of how God uh, is, is showing us something about this harvest time of this day because history repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun. And God is writing prophetically in, in the story because the stories in the Bible is God is, is we, learn, we learn by stories, right? Even when Jesus, he told parables and stories because stories, it interests you, doesn't it? It's a great story, you know. But there's a great thing that God is showing us something in this story of, of, um, of Judges chapter 6 through to chapter 8. He's showing us something. We're not going to get into all the details of, of everything, but just to show us a principle be here. Because and, and honestly, I'm not going to be too long this morning. We're just going to stop when we've had enough because I've got 14 pages, folks, 14 pages. And I'm not even going to even try to get even close, right? So... Let's just look at this subject. Coming out of self-doubt, we see Gideon was in the, can, certainly in a, in a state of self-doubt. Nobody can uh, deny that. And we see here in this, in this story, before there could be a great victory and deliverance of God's people, because they certainly needed deliverance. Uh, things were bad. The economy was bad. The population explosion, was, the, 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 the land was being destroyed. Right? God, a prop, the seed had already been sown. A prophet of God had already been on the scene, right? And so here's Gideon. Uh, things looked pretty bad, really bad, right? And here he is at he's harvesting. Uh, it's at her showing us it's harvest time, right? So the first thing, the pattern, we see a pattern here that God at first sends his prophet with a message of his voice to the people. And we've seen that in this age, and we want to put, put our spiritual glasses on, right? But then what follows that mess, that's not the end of the story. What follows that ministry of the prophet is the ministry of the angel of the Lord. Because after John the Baptist off the scene, we see Jesus is, is the ministry of Christ himself. And then we have his pre-crucifixion ministry and his post-crucifixion ministry. And in his post-crucifixion ministry, he is dealing with individuals. He's not a public ministry anymore. All right? Because, and we see that when it, in 1963, we see that public ministry diminished. And now he is 
is is dealing with eight people, right? Because their denominations had crucified him again. So we can see all these patterns very clearly. And so once the, the prophet has gone off the scene, and the appear, the, then there is the appearing of the Lord to Gideon. And that was for the purpose was the appearing of the Lord to Gideon after the prophet's ministry was for the purpose to bring him out of his self-doubt condition. The hardship and the oppression of the age and the economic squeeze you know, had caused Gideon to come into this state of mind because it affects you, right? When your bank balance runs out and the, and the shelves are bare and you can't feed the kids and the rent's due, whew, uh, scary. I've been, we've been there. My wife and I have been there years and years ago. Thank God we, he's blessed us. You know, we don't have that struggle now. But I think one thing, you, we need the Lord more and more. Right? Because that can happen again, right? Just like tomorrow. Things can change in the world. We saw that with COVID, right? So don't get relaxed and don't get get in your mind, think, oh yeah, I've got plenty of money. Yeah, well that money doesn't last very long. It runs out quite fast, right? And so so it's the Lord is the one that He's the provider. Right? And well if He provides by finance or if He provides by other means, He's the provider. All that we have is from the Lord, right? But we see that this condition of the age had, had. Uh, we see that the Bible is showing us this this condition of Gideon, and and that's why I want to say this and just understand it's not enough just to hear the prophet's message and just understand that the way I'm saying it, right? And we say, well, oh yeah, yeah well, it's it. And let's just just uh, look at this for a minute. See, it's it's not enough just to hear the prophet's message in the in this hour. Even though that that is like necessary, it's important. It's absolutely we believe that that's a part of the process. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet, right? And 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 John heard the voice come up higher. Now you know, so that's certainly a part of it. And and so God put that in this in this story here. God sends a prophet. But we see here in the book of Judges that it took the angel of the Lord himself to appear to Gideon after the prophet's ministry had come for the purpose of dealing with Gideon in order to bring him out of his self-doubt condition and into the revelation of what God had called him to be. Right? Look at this. And the Lord appeared unto him after the prophet's off the scene. Right, but what? When did he appear into, the, into him at harvest time? When he's hiding. And the Lord said unto him, "What are you doing there, you useless weakling?" <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Gideon would have known. Hey, he's talking about me. <laughs> but what did the Lord? What did the Lord say to him? Or the angel say to him? The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. See? So, a prophet of God's told us that too. But, but now an angel of the Lord himself is speaking directly into Gideon's life, right? Revelation 8, 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So we know that in this day that we're living in, that as a, a called out people by a prophet's message, that, that is very, it is very, it's very important for us not to just come out of denominational teaching and stop there. Because many good people leave, know that there's something wrong with denominations and they come out and they start their own little groups, right? And they love the Lord and at the level that they're called, whatever, right? So, but, so that's, for, as, as the bride of Christ, that's not enough just to come out. You know, many good people leave denominations and come out and form their own little groups. But we must 
we must then travel when we we must then travel on and go into Christ who is we're taught is the revealed word of of this day right that's bright age language we know what that re, when God opens his word his thoughts right this is my thoughts behind what's written and we coming into that thought of God ourselves that thought comes into us and our thoughts and his thoughts become the same thoughts right and so, so that is, is we want to go into Christ, and so we want to come out of. We want to come out of, but we want to go into. We want to go into. Also. And so, this going into must be, it must become a personal and ongoing event for every believer of the, this message. This, this because we want to. How does this look? How does this whole story look for me personally? In my life, it's not about just coming to church on Sunday and we come to church and we can believe the message and we, we listen to Brother Branham's sermons and we read our Bible and we pray and we wear long dresses and we do, you know, we just, all those things that we should do those things. But in our own personal walk with the Lord, we want to come into Christ, right? We want to really, it, we want it to be really, really real, a real thing, our walk with the Lord, see? So this, so this, so so this, the story of Gideon here is showing how it's going to take this angel to bring Gideon to deal with his life, just like the angel is is to dealing with our personal lives, personally, because this is not God is not dealing with the whole nation of Israel. He's dealing with Gideon, right? And so what, how he deals with Gideon, we know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, is how he also, we know he'd deal with us. It's not like, well, he was really important and I'm not important. No, there's no respected person in God. He doesn't, oh, well, Gideon, you know, he's a great Gideon and you're just nobody. God doesn't respect any person, right? So, so how he de de deals with Gideon is how he's dealing with each of us individually. In our life and through our lives, and so, and so this so this is a personal so this is what it must be going. We want to be going on in our personal and everyday lives as believers of this message. So this must become our everyday walk and and our growth in the Lord, right? Because our when we say our walk with the Lord, what what do we mean by that? We we mean that we are walking in agreement with truth, absolute truth of the thought of God. We're coming in, we're agreeing together as the Lord is revealing himself through his word, right? It might be a scripture reading. It might be a certain, you know, thing you go through in life and, and then the Lord reveals and opens up his word to you, and, and God is, and what are you doing? You're walking with the Lord. See, along with the Lord in this hour. And what's the purpose of that? Is to bring us into a marriage relationship with Christ, where the mind of Christ is in you. And your thoughts, of, and your thoughts about yourself are the same as God's thoughts about you. So that you can come into a confidence of who you really are, right? So that's what we, we're kind of talking about is coming out of self-doubt and into the revelation of your real self. So this is where Gideon, the angel of the Lord, was dealing with Gideon, and this is in his personal walk. And God dealt with him, you know, in certain ways. But God doesn't have to give you wet fleeces and dry fleeces, and, you know, he'll deal with you different, right, in the way he's made you. Spiritual food in due season, Brother Branham said, but thanks be to God we've got hidden food, spiritual food, that we're living on the goodness and mercy of the revelation of Jesus Christ in these last days, vindicating himself among his people. Amen. They went in. Elijah went in before the drought set in. Thank God for being in before the judgment sets in. Now is a time of coming out and going in getting out of these organizations and getting into Christ. 
are coming out and are going in time for all true believers. Right? This is a prophet of God. He's not me making up stories. It's good to come out, but there's no use just coming out. You've got to go in too. So he's saying this is a going in time for all true believers. And he says, there's just a couple of quotes I want to read here. We're right there, ready now. The only thing the church is coming out has got. So now he's saying this, he's giving us a bit more information here. The church that's come out, right? Yes, we've come out by, we've heard a shout, come out of her. We've come out of denominational teaching and understanding of, of things, right? That are not, that a prophet had to straighten out those truths, right? So he said, we're right ready now. The only thing the church coming out has has got to lay before the sun to ripen. So remember that it is the strength of the sun that ripens the grain. Right? So so autumn sun's not strong enough. Spring sun's not strong enough. It takes strong sun to ripen the grain. To lay in the so we have to lay in the presence of the sun. So to lay in the, let me, and I don't want to interpret this, but let me just make it very clear. To lay in the presence of the sun is for you to expose yourself to an ever-growing strength of the revelation of the S-O-N light, an ever-growing strength. Because it is the rising of the sun. And as the sun comes up, it gets hotter and hotter, Right? And that revelate so so it's to expose you. You have to expose yourself. Brother Branham said, "Lay in the presence of the sun." In other words, you expose your life to the revelation of the hour. As that sun grows in the strength of the S O N light of the message of the hour, and that is why God has raised up a fivefold ministry for that purpose. Right, because he's it's not that the fivefold ministry is a prophet of God. Nobody's trying to compete with what God sent a prophet, but but the God is the inspiration of the revelation that God has a channel that God uses among other channels, and one of those channels is a fivefold ministry, and and so we we want to. That's why we, we need we need ministry, we need preachers, we need you know, press play is good. I press play too, but I also believe in the fivefold ministry because that's also the scriptures, right? Yeah, I know you can get you know, ministry that do damage. Well you're always gonna get the enemy to try and get involved, right? But you don't throw throw all the truth out because the devil gets in and mucks up a few a few things, right? So we've got to keep a, uh, understand that, that God doesn't change his mind about his word. So the great, Brother Branham goes on, he says, the great combine will, will come by after a while. The wheat will burn the stalks. Uh, he said, uh, the stalks, he's talking about the stalks, but the grain will be gathered into its garner, right? So we want to be mature grain. And maturity, we're going to see maturity because we're going to see. I really appreciate Brother Gary Walker's sermon the other last week. I think it was that we had. We really, really enjoyed that, and I really because that just fitted in with what the Lord was, has been talking to me about, and how he t talked about the violinist and and how that that he was looking up at the balcony where his master had taught him, and he wasn't going to bow until his master stood up, and because everybody else was giving him a standing ovation, right. But when he looked up and he saw his master standing, then he, he knew that he'd passed the test, right? And then Brother Gary was telling us how that's that Stephen, right? And it just I just caught that I caught it right there. How that because Jesus he's on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, right? They know not what they do. Right? Joseph said, Hey, brothers, you're forgiven. You didn't know what you're doing. And here's Stephen, he's getting stoned, right? Imagine if we we're all stoning you, right? Jason, you're all stoning him. <laughs> it's like, hey, what are you stoning me for? You know, like that's pretty upsetting when people that you love 
It was Joseph's brothers. It was Jesus in the house of my friends. I preached that. That was my last sermon last year. Where did you get those wounds? In the house of my friends. Right? That's, the, that's hard, man. I'll tell you, that's what gets me. It's not when worldly people are mean. That's bad enough. But when message people are mean, like really mean, like really, really mean, meaner than even a human being would normally be mean, right? And then and God allows those experiences in your life because you have to you have to come to a maturity because look at look at Stephen, right? And they they're stoning him and he says, "Lay not this sin to their charge." And then he, then he looks up and he sees Jesus standing. Standing ovation. Because that's that's the performance I want to that's I've trained you well, right? So we want to be trained. I want to be trained. That 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 come that came out of Stephen's heart. He wasn't just saying that, oh I better say something nice, you know, because I want to have everybody read the Bible and think I'm not a nice person. Right? He it wasn't that. He really it came out of his heart. Something came over him. And that was divine love, all right? You can't, that's not agape, a, a filio love, brotherly love. Is it, the deal is off, you know, so much, and the deal's off, right? But the deal's, but divine love, right? In fact, Brother Branham said in, in one of those uh, messages I've been listening to, he said, he talked about the gifts, and he said, when divine love comes, he said, you can put those gifts on the shelf, and that's why Paul picked that up. He says, I can have all the gifts. I can do all the miracles. I can have all the revelation. I can do. But he said, uh, but if I don't have divine love, then it's just empty. It's meaningless. It's like a ting, ting, little thing. Ting. That's all it is. Right? Because, because look, at, when we look at this, it's so powerful. Because divine love, it will heal a person instantly. Brother Branham, in fact, he tells in that story that I was, I was relaying those stories. And in, in, in um, when love projects, uh, when uh, there's three three sermons he preaches, slightly different titles, right? And he's talking about uh, this woman. I think what was it? A woman that uh, was sick. I can't remember. Um, it was a healing. Oh no, sorry, sorry. It was it was the man that that the, I think it was in India when he embraced. Uh, there was a man came and he, he was blind. You remember that? And he, and Brother Branham said, I felt so sorry for him. He said, I looked at my shoes and my shoes fit him. He said, I put my arms around him. He said, I just loved him. He says, like you'd be old enough to be my dad. He said, this poor man. He said, probably didn't have a decent meal in his whole life and. And now he's blind. The devil's really dealt a terrible blow to him, right? And he, and he said, all of a sudden his eyes opened. He says, I love did that. Right? You see? So you put the gifts on the shelf. You just put it all on the shelf because divine love will, will deal with all those things. So that's, that's the ultimate. You know, it will deal with a killer bull. It will deal with the hornets. It will deal with the possum, right? It will deal with the, <clears throat> with the, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the man that was going to punch him, right? And all these different things, right? So that's, and, and, and one thing for certain is you can't manufacture it. So don't even try to pretend you've got it. We want, we, this, so the, the Holy Ghost, through the word of the hour, is, is bringing us to that place where he can drop that divine love on us, right? Because he talks about the, the, the grace and the, the supreme grace for the supreme hour and all those different things, right? So, so it, it's going to take the supernatural. And that's the answer. So we're dealing with that. We're dealing with this subject. We're heading in that direction. And you'll see as we go along, you'll see how this, this thought is going to come come up to that point, right? It may take a few services, but we'll we'll get there by the help of the Lord. So, 
So Brother Branham says here, so in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So, so by the coming, so when the Lord appears, like when the angel of the Lord appears, right, it's for the purpose of gathering, right? So when, that's what he says here, and by our gathering together unto him, so that we know that the shout has gathered the bride, right? So in the rapture message, Brother Branham says, the first thing comes when he starts descending from heaven so so because we see here when when this angel which was actually the lord himself brother Branham said in the message i've got the quote uh if if god be with us when we're all the miracles right he reads it out of the this this judges chapter six and when the lord the angel of the lord appears that angel descended from heaven to Gideon, right? In human flesh, or like an angel. I don't know if it was human flesh or theophany or whatever, but it was it was the Lord himself. Brother Branham said it was the Lord himself. And so we see here, so the Lord himself is, is appearing to Gideon. And Brother Branham mentions here, he says, there's a shout. He says, what is it? It's, it a, is, is a, a message to get the people together. So we've had that message, folks. We've had it. And it's gathered a people together. So this is not, we're not like, we're along the journey. Right? We, we've, there's no use trying to say, well, that's still got to happen. It's hap happened. These things, are, some of these things are history. Brother Branham says in, another, in the same message, uh, down a few in paragraph 164, therefore the message calls the bride together. See the shout. So the gathering, the coming of the Lord, the appearing of the Lord, Second Thessalonians two verse one, and the gathering unto him, he appears, and he speaks his voice, and that's what, what gathers right. So, as believers of the message, we believe these things. But what does the reality of that look like in our everyday, normal personal lives? Because many times it's hard for us to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit. And I've honestly, I've, I, I, there's a thought in my in my heart about this. And I almost, I just struggle to put it into words, right? And I've tried to explain it a few times, and it's so difficult because we're always looking for some maybe a feeling, and that's that's the certain experience or spiritual super, you know, in our lives, and so we can anchor onto that. But it's very hard to not to take that away and anchor onto the word directly as proof. You, you, you see that, what I'm saying there? So, so, because, so in other words, it's very hard for us to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Sometimes, sometimes it's not, but some, often it is because, because of the heart, humble way that God works with us. It's so humble. See, he deals with us in such, a, in such humility that we often miss seeing him. It was just, it's just too common. What was the first message Brother Brandon preached? God and simplicity. It's so common that you miss the whole thing. You won't even see that it's God because it's just normal life. There's nothing out of the ordinary. But it's in those common things of life that God reveals himself to us. Right? So, you know, if God displayed him how, himself, you young boys, you listen to this. If God displayed himself in some great supernatural wonder, or sent down a, a big ball of fire right in the platform. Boom. No. Oh. Your eyes are going boom wide. And then he spoke to us and a, a great deep booming voice came out of that fire. Ball. Big booming voice. Oh. Would you be in any doubt? Oh, I don't know if that was God or not. Well, I'll tell you what, there's not one person in the world that wouldn't believe that that was God. Not one person in the world. Because that's how humans respond. That's how we subconsciously, we're trying to find, look for God. Because that would be extreme. And we, that, that was God, man. Right? <laughs> if 
if I, if, if there was God, that was God. But when a, a humble man walks up to the pulpit, good evening, friends. Say, oh, that's just a Kentucky nobody. Right? You get the difference? So that's how we're wired in our subconscious. Right? See? But that is not uh, the, the way that God deals with us normally. He can, but it's not normal. That's not his normal way of dealing with us. Because that's not the character of God's ways of how he deals with his children. It's not, it's not his character. Now, it would be Hollywood's character, be Elvis Presley's character. But God is not a big showman. Listen to this. Write it down in your note. God is not a showman. God is not a show, a performer for a show to entertain to all people because he could send a big ball of fire right here now, burn a big hole in the carpet, big booming voice, right? The TV, later on this afternoon, all the TV stations would be here filming where the big ball of fire was and would have it on video and would be on YouTube and, and would be million, you know, 10 billion hits by tomorrow night. We'd monetize it and we'd get all the money, right? That's, that's, that's how man thinks. But God doesn't do that. God is not a showman, right? He's not a big showman. He is not on, on the stage with big spotlight shining on him. It's not him. He stands in the shadows. That's where you'll find him. But he wants to gather his children as grain, right, into the gamma. And so we know that it's going to be, it's going, that we know that it's going to be in, into a, going into a season. Sorry, we know that it is a going into season for the bride, for us as individuals. We've come out, yes. But we must go in like Noah going into the ark. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree, see? Like God says, come into the ark. He was already in the ark. Come into the ark. Come in, Noah. You've come out of the world, the thinking of the world, but come into, into the ark, right? So I don't know how much longer we'll go, but we're just a little bit more here. Genesis, let's read this scripture here, Genesis 14, uh, 41 verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and shaved, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment, and came in and unto Pharaoh. And every, every thing that is put in the Bible has a huge weight. It's not just, so this information, I want you to notice something. A coming out of the dungeon and a going in. Let's just we just read that. They brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and he changed his raiment. And he came in unto Pharaoh. Right? So you just read that scripture, but look at all, all the weight here. A change of garment. He's been washed, he's been shaved, he's changed your garment. That's what the Lord is dealing with us. A coming out of a prison house and a going into the king's house. Right. So when Joseph came out of the prison house, he went to live in the palace. You can't get the, the contrast. It's just it's extreme, both ends. Yes? But what caused that? God had been dealing with him for many years while he was in Potiphar's house. 
and in the prison house. We don't actually know how long he was in Potiphar's house and how long it was. We know it was two years between the, the dream of the butler and the baker and we know there was about two years, but we're not quite sure of how actually long he was because we don't know how long he was in Potiphar's house, really. Um, well, not that I could find anyway. And and so this this look at something, folks. This instant, one one minute he's in the dungeon. Boom! A f- couple of hours later, he's he's from this to that. Right. So to, it, it may have looked to others, it, it may have looked like he went from zero to hero. This is how we say it in the common English tongue. From zero to hero, right? In a very short space of time, it looked like that. But it's showing us that when when it's God's time to bring deliverance, that God can bring deliverance very swiftly. He can take you out of the dungeon and put you right at the other extreme, just boom, instant, right? When it's his time. See, it wasn't God's time. Remember, he said, remember me to the... I always get these mixed up. Baker was the one that got his head, lost his head, wasn't it? And the butler was the one that was restored, right? There's a little rhyme that you can remember that, but I forget. I remember it because I read it just a, a few week a, a week ago. <laughs> I don't know if that's cheating. <laughs> In fact, I've been going through Genesis 37. To 50, combing through that, 37 to 50, because that's the life of Joseph, right? I've been studying on that. So that you find that in Genesis 36, that story, I believe it's in Genesis, Genesis 36 or 7, it might be, I forget. Anyway, um, so it can happen very swiftly, but there's a, but the thing is there's a lot of preparation by God. And there's a lot of dealing with God on the inside before that time came with Joseph, right? God was dealing with Joseph on the inside of him. And that is why we we need to take courage while we're still in this prison house. All of the troubles you go through is is God dealing with your life so that he can take you from, from the prison house and put you straight to rule and reign within a thousand years and the millennium, see? So we see that. So Joseph went from his own father's house as a son to Potiphar's house as a servant to the prison house as a prisoner. Does this remind you of the Lord? It's us, our life too. Rebecca's, uh, Ruth's life, she was a servant she left her father's her home, right? She became a servant. Ruth resting. Uh, then she, you know, we know the whole story. And then she came into Boaz's house right at the end. So we see that same story again. But so, the, so Joseph, from his own father's house to Potiphar's house as a servant, to the prison house as a prisoner, and then to the king's house to sit at his right hand as ruler over all of Egypt. But each stage was a training ground for him. So that's we must understand that is the way God is dealing with us. He's going to bring us to that same place. And many people think that Joseph was only in one prison house while he was in the prison, but he was actually in two prison houses, right? His outer body was in a physical prison house, but his inner mind was in another prison house of self-doubt, of what God had revealed to him from the beginning. Yeah, really? Like, really? Everybody's going to bow down to me? I'm actually at the bottom. I'm actually serving the prisoners. They're the lowest of the whole kingdom, and I'm. They're not bowing to me. I'm looking up to them. Right? It's just so extreme opposite his external surroundings. That if that his he had to look look folks we're not making up stories, he had to overcome self doubt. 
He really had to. So these two, so the life of Joseph, we, it's going to see the same thing with how the Lord dealt with Gideon and how he dealt with Joseph. We're going to have a little song in a minute, right? And that self-doubt, that was the, the, ex, the result of the external surroundings of his life condition that looked so different, it looked so opposite to what God had promised him and like our story with Gideon. The mighty man of valor? Uh, he's obviously not talking to me. But, but this is the thing. The prison house was necessary for God to be able to deal with Joseph on an internal level. Because <clears throat> when Joseph was 17, he thought he was the bee's knees. He thought everybody's going to bow down to him and he's 17 and and, and he knows, you know, and everybody's going to, even his mum and dad, he even offended his mother and father. You gonna, uh, you, we're going to bow down to you as mum and dad, right? So that's no, that's no character that's fit to rule. So God had to work on Joseph internally, and it took, it took the prison house. It took these different experiences in his life, because we're going to see how God dealt with Gideon, how God dealt with Joseph, how God dealt with Brother Branham, how God deals with us, is all the same thing. It's all the same thing. So the prison house was, was necessary for God to be able to deal with Joseph on an internal level because the real prison house was the prison house in his mind. All right? So the first prison house that he had to come out of was the one in his own mind. Because it was a chain of circumstances. It was the circumstances. It was easy to trust God, but there's plenty of money in the bank and the car's going good and the, and the house doesn't leak and, and the lawns are mowed and you know everything's it's easy. Everything's smooth and everybody's happy and the family's going good and church is going good and everything. Well, it's easy to trust the Lord, all right? You don't have any too many mind battles, but it's when things go wrong, can you know it puts us into a prison house up here. And so the first prison house that has to be conquered, see, see that, that and this that let me show you something that that was what the angel came to Gideon to deal with the prison house up here. And he's showing us that this is this hour also. Right, so you know you can only imagine the mind battles that Gideon, that that's Joseph rather, that he would have fought in his mind while in the prison house, or how his brothers had been so mean to him, and how he was lied on by this evil woman, uh, and his reputation uh, turned into shredded rags. Everybody thought he was a tempted, tempted rape on this woman. I mean, that's a horrible thing, well, especially when you know you didn't do it, and now you've been locked up for it. Oh, that's that can eat eat your soul, man. That's like, oh, that can wreck you. That can your brain go, can turn to mash over that sort of stuff. All right. So, so God is showing us something here that that he was in a he was in a prison house before he could come out of that external prison house. God had to deal with him coming out of this prison house up here. Because if you, you don't have any, you need divine love, right? You, you need the, the Holy Ghost sometimes to come out of that, 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 to help you to deal with your life in order to bring you out of your own thinking and into the thinking of God concerning, concerning you. You know, this is how life sometimes deal, deals with us. You know, our bodies might not be locked up in a prison house of bricks and mortar, but nonetheless we can be going through a prison house experience within our minds of past events, of disappointments and mistreatments that lay within us in the subconscious realm. You know, I said to I told my wife, I said, look, sometimes it's subconscious things that we need the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking of myself, not of her, but you know that it's subconscious hurts, right? That you can't. You need the Holy Ghost to go in and 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 
deal with those things in your life. And this is, we see this as laid in the story of Gideon. We see how he had heard the prophet's message. That wasn't the problem. It wasn't that Gideon, you know, it's not like, oh, you need to go and hear the prophet's message. Well, he'd already, they'd heard the prophet. God had already sent a prophet. But, but to, to bring Gideon out of that prison house, right, before victory could come and salvation could come to Israel, God was dealing with an individual uh, personally, personally, in, the, in, in, in a way for him, not for you. God's not going to do a fleece for you, right, necessarily. But he's showing us in that story, I'm on the scene. I'm, gonna, I'm with you. I'm walking with you. And I'm here to bring you out of the prison house. All right? So this this was this this was a state of Gideon as the gathering of these three powers at harvest time. This was his condition, and so the appearing of the angel of the Lord came to bring him out of his inner, inner doubt and into the victory of what he was truly called to be. Praise the Lord! So let's have a little chorus together, and we'll pick it up. So we're at this. Just at the top of page five, so we we got quite a bit to go. So, we'll, Lord willing, but if the Lord will help us, we'll get into this a little bit deeper next week by the help of the Lord. I pray that that's been a blessing. Just even that little portion there, that really help us to know that that divine love is something you can't. Uh, you know, this is why I've always wondered why God's pulled back on the supernatural among the people of the message you know like like brother marcus was saying you know the pentecostals they have more miracles than we do you know and they do folks they do but this isn't right we we have miracles we have things we have miracles too man we we really do we've got plenty of testimonies right but but if god what happens is people are not mature enough to handle because as soon as somebody's got a, God gives a gift to somebody. Uh, you know, they might have been out of the world for five minutes. The next thing they're preaching to us, people that have been in the message for 30 years. I don't think so. Brother Bram said not to do it. The Bible says not to do it. But we look at performance. We look at, we, we judge a, per, we, a person's up there if they can perform. They're not up there if they have a revelation of the word. You get the difference? Because we, we, we like performance we like the ball of fire to appear and, and if that happened you know it attracts the crowds performance attracts the crowds a big church more offerings and we've got a great church going here see and so god knows where that's little baby he's dealing with little babies right it's pentecostal babies right that you rattle rattle the little thing and the baby's attracted to the little rattle right but we're not so he's held back. He's held back on that. He's pulled that back. Because you know why? Because there's no, not enough divine love. You can't handle those gifts without divine love properly. Because they'll go to they'll go to your head. They go to people's heads. And we've seen we've seen that. I've seen that over the years. You know. So God, look. It's just as easy for God to give someone a gift, like to let that gift be expressed. But the problem is, people would flock around that gift, and they well throw the message away because this guy's don't got this little supernatural gift and you'd be surprised how many people just are that shallow in their revelation unfortunately so god has he doesn't want us to be shallow he wants us to to lay in the presence of the sun and to ripen amen let's stand together and have a little chorus Beulah land. I'm longing, longing for you And someday on you the I'll stand Oh, when, there my home shall be eternal Oh shall be eternal a land sweet 
your land. Oh, once again, Beulah land, oh, Beulah land. I'm longing for you. And someday stand all oh, there my home shall be eternal my home shall be eternal your land sweet your Oh, I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am promised land. And Jordan's stormy banks stand and cast. Or towards Canaan's fear In its fair and happy land Where my possessions lie I am bound for the promised land And bound for the promised land Oh, and go with me I am bound for the promised land. Oh, all those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. They call the sun forever rains and scatters light. Oh, I am bound for the promised land, bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. No chilling winds, no poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore sickness and sorrow pain and death are feared and felt no more I am bound for the promised land I am bound for the promised land oh who will come and go with me I am bound for the promised land. Amen. Well, certainly the promised land is our relationship with the Lord. Divine love, right, is our destination. Praise the Lord. So try to take a leaf out of Brother Gary Walker's book because he preaches so short. So I, I want to start preaching short. <laughs> I don't know how successful, but we, my intent. <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry, I sometimes I preach a bit long. So, But Brother Branham, you know, most of his sermons are two hours. So it's not, you know, but we, we don't, I know people run out of steam and there's just, I've got so much to say, that's the problem. <laughs> but we just really thank the Lord for his care for us. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you for your love to us this morning. And just pray your blessing as we dismiss, Lord. And may your presence be with us. May you fill our hearts with that divine love, Lord. May you prepare us for that great climax, Lord, of this is the victory that will be in the love divine. 
Lord, and that's the victory, is the love divine, Lord. And we think of John, the great uh, disciple of love, Lord. And Lord, it's not just a, a brotherly love, but it's a divine God love that is passes all understanding, Lord. And that's what we want, Father. We can't give it to ourselves. We can't manufacture it by our thinking positive thoughts or different ways of trying to anoint ourselves, Lord. We can't do that, Lord. It, it takes the giver of the gifts, Lord, himself to come and fill our hearts, Lord. We just ask that you do that for each one of us, Lord, and really need you, Lord, and especially in these times that we're living so unstable and so changing and we, each one of us, want to go in, Lord, as we read that quote of your prophet, it's the bride is time, we, 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 it's a going in season, so we want to go, go in, Lord, we want to walk with you, Lord, and like Enoch walked with you, Lord, and he walked into a body change and translation, and we, we know that you've called us for that same event, Lord, in this hour, so we give you thanks, Lord, bless a little time now as we just uh, dismiss, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And um, why don't we sing that one? Lily of the Valley, uh, let your sweet anointing fill my life. Amen. Lily of the Valley, let your sweet anointing fill my life. Rose of Sharon, Rose of Sharon, show me how to grow in beauty in God's sight. Fairest of ten thousand, make me a reflection of your life. Day star shine down on me, let your love shine through me tonight. Oh, lead me, Lord, lead me, Lord, I'll follow everywhere you open up. Let me know your wisdom, show me things I've never seen before. Lord, I want to be your witness. You can take what's wrong and make it all right. Day star shine down on me, let your love night. Oh, once again, lead me, Lord. And lead me, Lord, I'll follow everywhere you open up the door. Let me know your wisdom, show me things I've never seen before. Lord, I want to be your witness, you can take what's wrong, make it right. Day star shine down on me, let your light shine through me in the night.